Okay, so in this video, we will consider a very nice application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So here's the problem. We want to evaluate the following limit. So the limit as n goes to infinity of 8 over n squared times the sum 1 over 2 plus n plus 4 over 4 plus n plus 9 over 9, 9 over 6 plus n plus all the way up to n squared over 2n plus n. Now this may look intimidating, but the idea will be to rewrite this limit of a sum as the limit of a Riemann sum, which will then become the definite integral of a function, which we can then of course evaluate, not directly, but using instead the fundamental term of calculus. And so that's the idea. So can we turn this into the limit of a Riemann sum, and then we can use the fundamental term of calculus. So let's see. So L is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of, well, the first thing is to realize that we are summing here n terms, right? 1 squared plus 2 squared, so 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, up to n squared. So we are summing n terms. 8 over n squared, we're going to leave it there for now. And we have the summation. Now to capture the change from each term, we need, of course, a dummy variable, so we'll use i. So i goes from to 1, the first term, up to n, the nth term. So the numerator is very easy, right? 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, up to n squared, so in general, i squared. When i is 1, 1 squared is 1. When i is 2, 2 squared is 4. When i is 3, 3 squared is 9, up to when i is n, n squared is n squared, over, well, the plus n's always there, and if you look, we're simply moving over the even numbers, 2 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 3, 2 times 4, up to 2 times n, so this is 2i plus n, and you can check when i is 1, 2 plus n, check, when i is 2, 2 times 2, 4 plus n, check, when i is 3, 2 times 3, 6 plus n, check. And when n is, when i is n, 2 times n plus n, check. So that's our first step, rewriting the expanded sum into a compact form using sigma notation. But again, we want the limit of a Riemann sum. So we don't want anything outside of our sum. But 8 over n squared is a constant with respect to i, so we can bring it in to the summation. And now this is getting closer to the limit of a Riemann sum, right? The limit of the sum, i goes from 1 to n, as usual, the limit as n goes to infinity, so far this is perfect, and all we want now is f of x i delta x to be giving us the argument of our summation. So that's what we're asking now, can we express the limit of this sum in the following form? Because, again, if we can express this limit of this sum into this form, then we know that this is the limit of the sum of f of x i times delta x, the area or the net area of the ith rectangle. And as we add from the first of the nth rectangle, the net area of each one, we get an approximate net area under f. And as n goes to infinity, we get the exact net area. This is, of course, by definition, the definite integral of f of x over some given interval a to b. So if we can choose the right value of a and b and the right function so that the limit of this Riemann sum is exactly our original limit, then we can evaluate the answer using not the limit of a Riemann sum, but the fundamental term of calculus. So what we now have is a guessing game. How do we choose a? How do we choose b, and how do we choose the function f? Well, 
let's see. Our delta x is we know the length of the interval divided into n equal parts so over n and xi if you remember is the right hand point of the ith interval so we start with the left hand point a and we add the i we add the a sorry i steps of size delta x which is of course b minus a over n so now we have our delta x b minus a over n, xi, a plus i times delta x, which is again b minus a over n. And if you think of it, all we want again is to pair up these two so that they're equal. Well, the limits are already the same, check. The sums are already the same, check. So all we want is this argument to equal to this argument. If we can again choose a, b, and f so that this expression becomes this one, then we're essentially done. So let's forget the limits and the sum and only focus on these two expressions. So the left hand side, i squared over 2i plus n, times 8 over n squared, can we make that equal to this expression? So f of, now I would replace xi by this expression, so f of a plus i times b minus a over n times our delta x, which is of course b minus a over n. So let's see. The first thing is to tackle the delta x, right? Some constant, all that b minus a is a some constant over n. We have an over n squared here. So let's pull out from this an over n. Now if you notice, then you may ask, well, if we factor a simple 1 over n, then is b minus a going to be 1? Well, if you think of it here, i is multiplied by b minus a. And here there is an i multiplied by 2. So we might guess that the b minus a perhaps should be equal to 2. That's our first guess. And of course there's a lot of ways to have b and a having a difference of 2, right? a could be 5, b could be 7, a could be 13, b could be 15. The idea is, and you'll see examples, there's a lot of other there's a lot of choices for a and b and f that will actually work out. The idea is try and make your life as simple as possible. It looks like i is multiplied by 2, i is multiplied by b minus a. It looks like b minus a should be 2. And of course the simplest choice is a to be 0 and b to be 2. So that's our first guess. And again, sometimes you'll make a guess and it's not going to work out. But as you tweak your guess, then you'll converge to the equality being satisfied. So now let's replace our a and b and see what happens. The left hand side stays the same. So we have now i squared over 2i plus n times 8 over n squared. And will that be equal to f of a is 0, so that goes away. b minus a is simply 2, so we have 2i over n, so f of 2i over n times 2 over n. So we can cancel 2 over n on both sides. So if you cancel the 2, that leaves you with a 4, that's 2 times 4 is 8. If you cancel the n, you're left with a single n here. So now, what we're asking is, can we find a function of 2i over n that will be equal to this side? So, i squared over 2i plus n. Times 4 over n. And so the task now 
if you want to express this as a function where the argument is 2i over n, is to express every part of this expression in terms of 2i over n. Well, if you think about it, if you want, because we're so close here, we have 2i, but it's not over n, we could factor from this expression an n, and if we do, we'll be left with 2i over n plus 1. Right? If you don't see it, multiply back 2i over n times n, 2i, n times 1, n, check, times, of course, the other term, 4 over n. So we, ha we now have our first 2i over n, plus 1 is a constant, that's fine, and then we're left with 4 over n times 1 over n, that's 4 over n squared. But if you notice, i squared, 4 n squared, this is 4 i squared over n squared, is exactly the square of 2 i over n. If you square 2 i over n, you get 4 i squared, check, over n squared, check. So now we're basically done. As we have just said, square 2, you get 4, check. Square i, you get i squared, check. Square 1 over n times 1 over n squared, check. So this over 2i over n plus 1, check. And now we have our function. The leftover expression has been expressed as a function of 2i over n. So we can now easily obtain f of x. It is a matter of a simple substitution. We simply want to replace the argument 2i over n by the argument x. So replace everywhere in here 2i over n by x, which will give you x squared over x plus 1. And now we have our function, and if you recall, a was 0, b was 2. And now we're essentially done. If you go back, with this choice of function, this choice of a and b, mission accomplished. The two arguments are exactly the same, so this equality is true. Therefore, our limit, the limit of the original expression, is exactly this definite integral with the corresponding choice of f of x, a and b. So, we have the integral from a to b, from 0 to 2, of f of x, x squared, over x plus 1 dx. And this is now a much simpler problem, as we have the possibility of evaluating this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now here we have two options. We can make a u substitution, replacing x plus 1 by u, and this would work out but we can do simpler if we simply perform a long division, as we have a degree 2 polynomial over a degree 1 polynomial. And after a long division, the integral will become essentially trivial. So let's see what happens. So x squared, dividing by x plus 1. What times x is x squared? Of course it is x. Multiply all of x plus 1 by x, gives you x squared plus x. We subtract and we're left with a negative x. The degree is 1, the degree here is 1, we have to repeat, so minus 1 gives us minus x minus 1. We subtract, we're left with plus 1. This is a constant, the degree is 0, the degree here is 1, 0 is strictly less than 1, and we are done long division, which implies that the function x squared over x plus 1 equals x minus 1, plus the remainder 1 over the divisor x plus 1. And now the integration is basically trivial. We first find our antiderivative, so power of rule x squared over 2, 
minus x plus, and the integral of 1 over x plus 1 is simply the ln of x plus 1 in absolute value. This is our antiderivative, which we evaluate between 0 and 2. And then we just plug it in. If we replace x by 2, we'll have 2 squared, which is 4 over 2 is 2, minus 2, this is 0, plus the ln of 2 plus 1, 3. So all we're left with is the ln of 3. Again, the ln of 2 plus 1. Minus the antiderivative at 0, which will give us 0 minus 0 plus the ln of 0 plus 1, which is the ln of 1. That's all we're left over with, but the ln of 1 is also equal to 0. So in the end, we're left with the ln of 3 as our final answer. And so we catch our breath, and we can go back now to our conclusion and to the original problem. What was L? Well, L was the limit of this rather impressive summation. And now, with the help of our knowledge of limits of Riemann sums, the definite integral, and the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can say this limit is exactly the ln of 3, which I think you can agree with me is far from obvious. And let's summarize what kind of steps were involved. The first was to rewrite the sum compactly using sigma notation. Then we asked the question, can we express the limit of our sum as the limit of a Riemann sum? which will then turn into a definite integral. So can we choose a, b, and f so that the old argument becomes the new argument? So what we have is a guessing game. The old argument, the new argument. We try and choose first a and b, and then match the function of the new argument with the original argument. And once that's accomplished, then we have our f of x, and then we can go back and say, instead of evaluating the limit of the sum directly, we can instead evaluate, with the help of the fundamental theorem of calculus, this definite integral. So we had our function, our value of a and b. We find the definite integral by finding the antiderivative, then we evaluate, and we arrive at a final answer of ln of 3, which again, I think should be stressed, is a highly non-trivial answer. So it's a very nice application of the fundamental theorem of calculus.